given up on the uh, on the prospects for uh, biogas for biomethane uh, as a key part of the bioenergy sector uh, going forward. We've got a fantastic panel um, today. Uh, kicking off for us is uh, Charlotte Morton, who's the chief executive of the World Biogas Association, who's going to frame what we're talking about in terms of the uh, potential for the sector and how our panelists see it developing. And we also have uh, with us uh, Peter Zineski from the International Energy Agency, the prime go-to forecasters in the energy sector. And Peter uh, can talk through the IEA scenarios for uh, biogas. Uh, we have Fabio Montemuro uh, from BP. Uh, BP recently put their money where their mouth is um, when it came to biogas uh, by buying the largest uh, biogas operator in the United States uh, and is therefore very committed, as of course Shell uh, did in buying the largest biogas operator in Europe and Total Energy uh, with a big investment in Poland and elsewhere. Uh, and we're also joined by uh, Ruud Kampener, uh, and Ruud is in the cabinet of um, uh, the Energy Commissioner at the EU Commission, therefore very well placed. Uh, the EU raised some eyebrows uh, when the, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine with a very optimistic forecast, or target rather, I think I should be clear, uh, a target for the growth of biogas and biomethane. Uh, and we're very pleased to have Rude here to talk through how quickly the sector can develop uh, in Europe. So uh, there's a lot of agreement about growth uh, and uh, marginal disagreements about the pace of growth and some of the constraints. Who better to kick us off on this uh, than Charlotte Morton, our chief executive, setting the scene? Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris, and i um, delighted to see uh, all of you here today to talk about uh, my favourite topic. Um, and of course, uh, the rate of growth is the most critical element to it. Um, as Chris says, the industry is already growing hugely fast, so um, it's very exciting to be able to talk about how fast and what things to that rate of growth. So let me start just by giving you a little bit of background about the World Biogas Association. We were founded almost seven years ago now at COP22 in Marrakesh in 2016 by national associations from the UK, USA and Italy, along with 20 founding company members. We now represent over 100 organisations from every continent, uh, including about 30 national associations. And we sit on the leadership groups of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition uh, for Waste, Energy and Policy. And that's important because the CCAC is a delivery body for the Global Methane Pledge. We're also an observer with the UNFCCC, the Global Bioenergy Partnership. We're a member of the CTCN, the GMI, the Biofuture Campaign and a partner of the C40s Network. And we collaborate with many other international organizations, including, as we can tell from today, the IEA, UN, Food and Agriculture Organization, EU, etc. Mostly, similarly, to ensure that we are coordinating uh, the delivery of uh, the full potential of the industry. And we were most recently invited by the Indian government to be a founder member of the Global Bio Biofuels Alliance, which was launched a week or so ago. Next slide, please. Now let me set the scene a little bit. We humans create around 105 billion tonnes of organic wastes every year. Sewage, food waste, manures and slurries and industrial processes, etc. They emit methane and other greenhouse gas emissions. And as you know, methane is at least 28 times more potent than CO2. And so the, the global methane assessment uh, by the CCAC demonstrated that tackling methane is the most immediate and cost-effective way to keep global warming below two degrees C. 150 countries have now signed up to the Global Methane Pledge, committing to reduce global methane emissions by 30% against 2020 levels by 2030, which all of you can work out is just over six years away. So it's very soon. Now, all of these organic wastes also contain valuable resources, 
indeed sufficient energy to replace around one third of today's natural gas demand. And as you all know, biogas is easily purified to be a perfect substitute for fossil natural gas, thereby increasing our energy security and independence. It can power trucks, ships, and potentially even planes. So it's an absolute win, 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 win opportunity. Unfortunately, now starting to get the recognition it should, which as I said, means that the industry is now growing at a very exciting rate. But the question we all want to know is how fast and indeed, can we make it grow any faster? Planet Earth, and therefore all of us, need it to grow as fast as possible. Next slide, please. So how can we sensibly compare forecasts? Well, this chart puts the six International Energy Agency and BP scenarios on the same base, on the same basis, indexed from 2021 as 100. It shows a relatively close consensus on growth to 2030, and then a widening divergence where all the BP scenarios show higher growth than the IEA scenarios. But please bear in mind that they're not forecasting quite the same thing. BP is forecasting biomethane, whilst the IEA is forecasting modern gaseous energy, which is a slightly wider definition. The EU target is biogas. Next slide, please. Now, let's do a reality check on these forecasts. The World Biogas Association does a calculation of the global potential for biogas based on a bottom-up look at feedstocks, sewage, manures and slurries, other agri-wastes, food and food and drink processing wastes, etc. Now, clearly, if any of the forecasts were exceeding the total potential, what we can call the feedstock frontier, then that would act as a binding constraint. The good news is that even the most optimistic forecast, the IEA's net zero emissions, doesn't broach the frontier. So there's still more potential to go, although not much. Now you may also ask why we have the feedstock frontier declining over time. Well, that's because uh, we believe there'll be steady pressure to reduce food waste. True, food waste tends to rise with incomes but it also falls with improved techniques of conservation and public awareness. And we know that separate food waste collections, for example, do lead to something like 10 to 14% reduction in food waste arisings. Now, because this chart is in terawatt hours, not all the projections start from the same place. So you can see that BP's biomethane total is consistently lower than the IEA wider definition. Next slide, please. For those of you who like to know what the projections for the total market suggest, this slide translates those growth paths shown in the graphs as lines into compound annual growth rate with a range that looks less different, effectively 8 to 13% a year. Nevertheless, it's worth emphasizing that these are oh, very... Look, I, think we've gone, I think we've gone one slide too far on. Can we just go back, uh, back one? Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Oh, well done, Chris. Nevertheless, it's worth emphasizing that these are very high growth rates for any sector. And to meet that sort of ambitious growth path, we're going to need a lot of things, including policy, to fall in place. So now we can go back onto that slide. So here's a view of what we need on policy if we're going to meet the potential with some timelines. It needs to start with a commitment to biogas in NDCs the so-called nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. Next slide, please. There simply isn't yet enough awareness amongst policymakers of the potential of biogas. Just 39% of the nationally determined contribution plans tabled by 195 countries even discuss or acknowledge biogas, biofuels or biomass. Next slide. Now, you'll be pleased to know I'm not going to go into the detail of all of the policy recommendations that can help unlock the potential of biogas, but here's a, a basic checklist. Please do get in touch with me if you would like to know more or to join the expanding renewable sector with power that you can turn on and off, unlike wind and solar. You can't turn on and off, unlike wind and solar. Thank you. Back to you, Chris. You're on mute. Ah, thank you very much, Charlotte, for that bit of scene setting. It's always good 
not to be on mute if you're attempting to chair this uh, exercise. Um, great. And now just to make sure that we've got the right slides for the right people in the right order, uh, could I just know whose slide deck is on next? And I will introduce our next speaker. Is it Peter? Yes. Uh, perhaps I could then introduce Peter Zinevsky from the International Energy Agency. He's the expert on biogas and biomethane uh, within the bioenergy sector. And Peter, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, I hope everyone can hear me just fine. Uh, thanks again, WBA and Charlotte, uh, for the invitation um, today. Very pleased to be here and to share with you some of the findings that Charlotte already touched on, um, you know, and clearly there's a lot of differences, not just across organizations in the way that biogas is, so biomethane and biogas uh, is modeled um, and the assumptions around growth rates, but also within um, the IA, we look at um, the world through the lens of scenario analysis. And in that lens, um, we make uh, assumptions and, and um we apply different rates of learning and different rates of deployment, different types of policies uh, that can support different types of fuels across the energy sector. Um, and some of those scenarios meet uh, climate targets, others uh, just hold up a, a mirror to today's uh, policy settings and see where the energy sector might evolve. So it's in that context that I'll just briefly share with you today some of our emerging findings on specifically on biogas and biomethane and what kind of contribution it makes um, to the energy sector in different geographies and sectors across time. Um, so as we all know, of course, uh, today, uh, much of the biogas uh, and biomethane production globally is actually concentrated in Europe. Um, of course, there's, there's developments all around the world, but today the EU produces around 75 terawatt hours of biogas and about 35 terawatt hours of biomethane. Uh, so that's proportional on the biomethane side to about 3 billion cubic meters of natural gas. So that's just under 1% of the EU's total natural gas demand. So we're starting from a very low base and it's great you know, uh, that we're seeing growth in this sector, um, but it still remains a relatively small part of the overall energy sector. Also within Europe, a lot of that biogas uh, production is concentrated uh, in Germany. Uh, there's around 9,000 individual biogas installations there. Uh, and the primary source of feedstock for that biogas were energy crops. So that really underpinned the growth of uh, Germany's biogas industry. But we now see policy uh, in Germany and across Europe shifting towards the use of more sustainable feedstocks, ones that don't necessarily compete uh, with um, uh, food production uh, in the agricultural sector that leverages, as Charlotte mentioned, the enormous amount of, of waste uh, in agriculture and uh, in human society that we produce each year, uh, not least the amount of methane uh, that comes from things like landfill sites. So we know that the Repower EU target uh, is very ambitious and uh, is, is um, targeting a 35 BCM uh, uh, level of production of biomethane by 2030. So that's well over uh, 10 times the current level. And so that would imply an average growth rate terms around 40% uh, percent growth per year um, to 2030. So it's to achieve this much more biogas needs to be produced. That biogas has to be uh, converted or purified into biomethane. And the factors that could accelerate that growth include things like streamlining permitting. Right now it takes very many years to get a permit to build uh, one of these uh, facilities. There's, there's a need for a streamlined fabrication of standardized biodigesters, dedicated biogas financing facilities and robust support schemes such as quotas and, and feed-in tariffs. So before we get to that stage, we need to maybe assess the level of biogas and biomethane potential uh, in Europe, um, you know, the focal point of the efforts currently to scale up the fuel. Um, and so we've seen several studies uh, in recent years confirming there's enough feedstock. But at the IA, we wanted to consider the spatial distribution of that feedstock, because ultimately, 
biogas and biomethane is a is a local resource. It requires a local assessment of factors such as uh, 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 where the facility might be uh, developed, where the feedstocks are, how far they can travel, where you can put uh, the biogas if you need it for local heat and power, or if you can inject it into pipelines. So our analysis considered 30 feedstocks on a spatial level, so wheat, barley, sugarcane, beetroot, those kinds of uh, feedstocks in terms of the waste that they produce and how much could be uh, usefully leveraged. Um, so we consider things like sequential cropping, use of crop residues, uh, you know, uh, the size of agricultural plots and so on. And also just here uh, in, in, in the chart, you, uh, in the figure you can see on that map, um, an overlay of, of, of the major gas pipelines in Europe. So yeah. again, prox proximity. Right interrupt but we can't see your slides can you reshare ah sorry thank uh, you yeah of course um apologies i just got through a, a ton of stuff without any of you seeing it so um could you can you see it now it's a blue screen yeah we can yeah. it's the ah. map yeah apologies um so i just very briefly went through um, today's uh, level of biogas and biomethane uh, production in Europe, um, and now showing you a, a map of the feedstock potential that we performed uh, in the European uh, Union, uh, and then overlaid the, the gas pipelines on top, uh, just to show uh, that of the more or less 80 billion cubic meter of potential that we see that can be developed to 2030, uh, around 40 BCM of that, or around half of that, is, is sufficiently close to uh, uh, nearby natural gas infrastructure such that it could be developed uh, without a huge amount of additional costs related to grid infrastructure. Now, I know Chris uh, was also interested in understanding the costs of, of biogases, and we've done this analysis as well um, to benchmark against today's natural gas prices. As we all know, uh, they've come off the record highs, but they remain elevated in Europe following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, they're around $11 uh, per MBTU, about 35 uh, euros per megawatt hour. Um, and what you see here is our detailed uh, cost curve for the feedstock potential that you saw uh, globally on the, uh, in Europe on that map. Uh, and you see the Repower EU target here of about 35 BCM uh, can be developed uh, up to around uh, $25 per MBTU. So that's still some way above uh, the level that we're at currently. It is below the level, the record highs that we reached, um, but indeed what needs to be done uh, to close that cost gap is for policy to step in uh, to um, um, develop uh, uh, support mechanisms for, for biogas and biomethane production plants in Europe. So we see a lot of countries doing that at the moment. Uh, you know, France is is one of the most rapidly growing markets in this area, uh, benefiting from feedstock uh, uh, feed in tariffs and from uh, grid injection support um, from uh, distribution and transmission operators. Now, if we zoom out to look at uh, the global potential, so in the international agency, we're uh, very much focused on uh, global potential and global deployment of biogases and. You see here that we've done this assessment, not just for Europe, but for whole, the whole world. And then you see quite a lot of potential outside Europe, specifically in Southeast Asia, in India, in Brazil, also in North America. Um, overall, the feedstock uh, uh, concentrations are show that there are a variety of sweet spots that can be targeted for um, as go-to areas for, for biogas deployment and development and support schemes. Um, and what we notice uh, is that, um, you know, uh, overall, if you take into account, um, you know, that the crops and, and, and agricultural waste are used for different purposes for animal feed and so on, what you're left with is around 350 BCM, more or less, that can be developed uh, that's nearby to gas grids and that doesn't, uh, you know, that can be con considered uh, sustainable potential without any uh, competition with uh, food uh, or agricultural um, or, or, or limits to biodiversity. Uh, so for that reason, um, and this is just looking a bit more deeply at the, at the um, projections that we made 
Uh, last year in our announced pledges scenario, that scenario is one where governments meet their climate targets on time and in full, despite not necessarily knowing the details just yet on how that's, that's to work out. Um, and here you see that the majority of biogas is deployed to 2050 uh, come in the form of upgraded biomethane. And that biomethane can get used across multiple different sectors. So not just in transport where it's targeted today, but also in industry, uh, in heavy duty transport, uh, in um, buildings and residential areas, especially around um, areas that, that, that are close to agricultural uh, zones uh, where you can uh, uh, you know, leverage that circular economy as well. And that leads us to a production level um, close to what I mentioned earlier, uh, the 350 BCM that can be tapped uh, in, a, in a reasonably cost competitive way uh, around the world. Uh, as a share of total gases, uh, that's around 10%, so far, far above the 1% we see today uh, by 2050. So uh, biomethane makes a, a strong dent in natural gas demand, but it also displaces oil use in transport, coal use in industry, and so on. So it's not just a story about replacing natural gas and bio, with biogases, but also uh, other fossil fuels. The spread of deployment, as I mentioned, it's concentrated in Europe uh, currently, also uh, through the in Inflation Reduction Act uh, and tax credits for biogas facilities there. We expect quite a large scale up to 2030 in the United States and elsewhere in North America. And then beyond that, it's really uh, China and emerging markets in Asia with that huge feedstock potential, that large uh, amount of, of industrial waste uh, and, and municipal waste uh, that starts to get leveraged uh, as costs come down and as uh, climate policies uh, start to be scaled up in that scenario with targets in China to 2060 and India as well uh, to 2070. Um, so that's uh, the, the, the conclusion. I'll, I'll bring it back to uh, Chris and happy uh, to take any questions uh, in the chat. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's great, Peter. Um, and I think uh, the next, anybody who's had a problem following all those slides, don't worry, they will be on the recording and um, I think uh, uh, available. So uh, you'll be able to go back and look at them. But some very interesting thoughts there about the geographical distribution clearly the cat because of where europe starts the growth rates for biogas and biomethane in north america and in asia are going to be even higher uh, than they are in europe so that's going to be an interesting um, part of the uh, of developments going forward um whose slides are on next adam i think you had uh Fabio, great. Uh, well, can I introduce then Fabio Montemuro, uh, who is the Head of Power Systems and Renewables at BP. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that BP were one of the energy super majors that have put in, uh, put their money where their mouth is by investing in biogas um, and therefore are now a part of the biogas community and know the uh, perils and pitfalls as well as the potential. So over to Fabio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and uh, hello, everyone. Greetings from uh, London. This is Fabio. Uh, again, thanks to Chris and Charlotte for the invitation. I look after power and renewables in the Economic Energy Insights team in BP. We are the team that puts together the, um, the energy outlook. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms for, uh, you know, the plans for today, I just want to spend the next five minutes or so covering three things. Um, a brief overview of the main scenarios in the BP Energy Outlook that my team puts together, um, a deep dive into the prospect for bioenergy in the energy transition, and then at last some flavor, some of the most exciting things that uh, BP is doing in the biogas and biomethane space, and, and Chris mentioned some of them already. So, so let's jump in. Uh, and time is of the essence. Now, I did not know that Charlotte would make uh, my life easier by introducing the BP scenario in an earlier presentation. So thank you, Charlotte. Uh, but you know, likewise, I'm not expecting everyone to be familiar with the BP energy outlook necessarily. So if you're not, a bit of self-serving advertisement here, uh, Google it up. It's a, it's a, it's a great read, of course. Um, 
so in the in our energy outlook, we use three main scenarios, which we call accelerated, net zero, and new momentum. Um, and really, with those scenarios, we try to explore possible developments in the energy system out to 2050. And in this chart, you see the global CO2 emissions associated with those scenarios. Accelerated and at zero explore how the energy system might change to achieve um, carbon emissions reduction commensurate with two degree and 1.5 degree increase by end of the century, respectively. So they can be seen as a sort of what if scenario, what you need to believe will make happen, right? Um, new momentum instead is designed to capture the broad trajectory along which the energy system is currently traveling. And we do factor in the marked increase in government ambitions and pledges for decarbonization. Right, so um, next one, please. What does this mean for bioenergy as a whole, as a sector, right? So uh, let's look, let's, let's, uh, lots to take in in this chart for the accelerated scenario uh, about bioenergy. So let me paint a picture for you while you try to digest the chart. Um, and really what this chart is saying that the use of modern bioenergy, and that includes uh, modern solid biomass, like wood chips or wood pellets, biofuels and biomethane, it increases significantly. Uh, and that because bioenergy is key to decarbonize what we call hard to abate sectors and processes. And I think importantly, for a just energy, energy transition, uh, helping displacing the use of traditional biomass, such that used for cooking and heating predominantly in developing countries. Now, of all this uh, bioenergy uh, sort of subsector, biomethane, we believe, is the bioenergy vector which has the fastest growth rate globally, uh, albeit starting from a smaller base than for example, biofuels. And that is biomethane from a wide range of, uh, of, uh, of feedstock sources that we from wastewater treatment. Um, now, next slide, please. Um, if we close up on biomethane and we just look out to the next sort of, um, you know, 10, 50 years or so, uh, we see how biomethane grows significantly in all our scenarios. Um, and we are jumping to a different unit now. We went from exajoule to BCM. Um, and so we're going, we think biomethane could go from about five BCM in 2019 globally uh, to around um, 90 BCM roughly in accelerated and at zero by 2035 um, and more than 60 BCM in new momentum by 2035. And so just to give you a bit of a sense of the scale of this potential, of this growth, um, before the invasion of Ukraine, uh, Russia's natural gas pipeline flows to Europe uh, was about 140 BCM, right? Um, and, you know, as, as we, we, we heard, uh, biomethane is, is the great advantage that is fungible, right? And so it can be used directly or can be blended into a natural gas grid as a direct substitute for natural gas. Uh, and we see its use shared broadly and equally across industry, buildings, and transport. Um, and next one, please. Um, so this is my uh, last slide. And so this is sort of just to give you a, a quick overview of some of the um, you know, most recent, I would say exciting uh, activities that BP is, uh, is carrying out in the biomethane and, and bio, biogas space. Um, and, you know, if, you, uh, if you're not familiar with BP's strategy, bioenergy is one of our five strategic transition growth engine that we intend to grow rapidly through this decade in service of our aims and ambitions. Um, and to give you a sense of the, of the commitment and the ambition here is uh, in 2022, so last year, BP invested 4.9 billion, uh, so that is around 30% of our total capital expenditure into our transition growth engines, right? And that includes biomethane and biogas. Uh, and this compares to around 3% in 2019. Uh, so there is a tenfold increase in the last four years. Uh, and we, we expect this proportion to, to grow to around 50% by 2030. Um, we have, of course, very active teams in uh, 
in, uh, in biogas. I think some of them are here on this call um, and they do, you know, they do, um, they trade biogas across the main uh, European hubs, UK, Netherlands and Germany and beyond. Um, they work with producers and developers to, to procure offtake so that projects uh, are developed and eventually built. Um, and we are building our presence in Europe. And that includes, for example, our 2021 investment in GasRec in the UK, which is the UK largest provider of bio LNG and bio CNG to road transport. And we are looking to expanding into heavy goods vehicles in other key European markets, for example, through Aral, which is BP's four core brand in uh, uh, in Germany, if you did not know. Uh, and, you know, and this slide is about this. In, uh, in late 2022, we accelerated our, uh, our, um, our journey in bioenergy by acquiring Arkea, which is a leading U.S. biogas company. Um, and Arkea, it's, it's really a, a big deal. It operates around 50, what they call in the U.S. RNG, renewable natural gas, and the landfill gas to energy facilities across the U.S., um, and what's exciting, they have a development pipeline supporting a fivefold volume increase by 2030. So really, really a great company. Um, why we like Arkea, it, it enhances our ability to support uh, our customer, the, the carbonization goals. It does help us progress on our aim to reduce the carbon intensity of the energy and products that we sell the world and um, uh, it taps into our, our trading capabilities and uh, global customer relationship. Um, so I hope that give you enough flavor of what we think and what we're doing. Um, so that's that's everything from me from now. Uh, I will need to duck out of the webinar 15 minutes before it's end. So please keep all the difficult questions for after I leave. So back to you, Chris. <laughs> okay, Fabio, thank you for that. Uh, and now last but not least, um, Ruda, I don't think you've got slides, but if you would like to uh, say a few opening words, uh, that'd be great. We've seen that the EU uh, repower EU plan post uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was very ambitious. Um, and there's obviously a target which you may or may not meet, but it would be good to know a little bit more about um, how you see uh, production in the EU ramping up to meet that sort of target. Yes, and thank you very much for uh, for inviting me uh, um, for, to the to this webinar. Uh, indeed, biogas is really important for for the EU and the European uh, energy transition. Uh, the previous colleagues have already shown that uh, this is not something new. Uh, the European uh, European policies has had uh, renewable energy targets in place since 2009. And that, of course, is one of the important reasons why you have also so much biogas being developed already within, within the EU. But indeed, the, the, the share of biomethane from that biogas has, has remained relatively small. And uh, this has been a policy ambition to, to, to grow this. But of course, now with the Russian uh, invasion into Ukraine, this has really come to the forefront, and I think Fabio just 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 mentioned one one of those reasons. Um, we've been reliant on the import of of, of, of Russian natural gas. Uh, we've cut this tremendously uh, last year, but we still have about uh, 20 BCM of of natural gas flowing into the EU, mainly through kind of uh, the the pipelines. So, so there's still natural gas flowing in, into the EU, and at the same time, we have this this resource available, you know, on our land uh, near our farmers. Actually, across the EU, there's no member state, maybe except for the islands, where there is not a potential for for, for the production of localized biomethane. So that's why it really is kind of um, uh, such a key policy priority. I mean, it's it, it's solution that is available. It's right here right here and we can immediately start using it like the previous man uh, uh, speakers mentioned before we just simply replace the natural gas with the biomethane and um, also of course biomethane because it can be produced locally is important for both it's important for security local security but also sustainability uh, you know your source which is very important 
and I think also competitiveness. Uh, the competitiveness of of uh, having biomethane and biomethane sourced locally, instead of depending on kind of global markets with their swings. Uh, we've all seen, I think, the the news that, of course, impacts of of strikes in Australia have on the European natural gas prices. So it's important for all of these the, the, these elements. Now. Also in the previous speakers already mentioned, of course, the uh, the ambition that we have to produ produce 35 uh, BCM of biomethane by, by 2030. And that indeed means uh, doubling, no, uh, multiplying by 10, the current volume of production. So this is big, um, but there are very promising signs, I think. So if we now compare the latest numbers that we get also from the industry on biomethane, uh, we see a 20% increase. So we saw the growth numbers Charlotte uh, represented. We have seen, of course, from a small base, but a 20% growth in the market. And also uh, earlier this year, we had kind of a new update on the number of biomethane and biogas plants in the EU. And there, again, the numbers increased with 30%. 30, uh, 30 so it, there is a really, there is a momentum going on, but of course, uh, it's not enough um, to really achieve our targets of 35 BCM of biomethane by 2030. We, we need two things. Um, first, besides the targets that we have already in place, we need to have a supportive regulatory framework. And there also, and that is something new, a clear industrial and value, value chain approach. And on the regulatory framework, one of the pieces of this European green uh, deal uh, uh, that we've been talking about is a quite technical piece of legislation, which, is to, which essentially is called the decarbonized gas and hydrogen package. Now, what's in it is in the name. It really is about decarbonizing the gas that we are currently consuming within Europe. So that also looks at how can we ensure that locally produced biomethane gets equal access, access to the market because we have these pipelines throughout Europe and then can easily be traded across the EU. Because we do see uh, that the demand for biomethane uh, for certain energy sectors is becoming attractive, uh, not necessarily on price, even though, of course, last year prices were very attractive for biomethane, but also because the value it, 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 it brings to the end consumer of replacing its natural gas with biogas. Um, the, this package, this, 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 uh, this regulation is still on the discussion, so we've put this proposal forward, uh, but we hope that actually by the end of the year, or even before the end of the year, we have that piece of legislation uh, finalized. And that would actually mean that biomethane becomes like a real player in the European gas market. It can really start accessing the gas and kind of bringing that to the end consumer. And then of course, besides that regulatory piece and besides the target that we have, we also have this recently uh, agreed target of at least 42.5% of renewables in our overall energy system. So that, again, provides another boost for biomethane development because it's impossible to meet these renewable energy targets just in the electricity sector alone. So we will need to start replacing natural gas uh, and other fossil fuels in the energy sectors, in the transport sector, in the building sector, and in the um, uh, industry sector. So the, of course, the, the fuel supply obligation, this is an obligation that we've had in place already for the transport sector, is again also one of those powerful instruments to really ensure that there's going to be offtake of that bio uh, gas and biomethane for the transport sector. Now, the second point that I wanted to, to, to mention here, and this kind of goes beyond the kind of the, 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 the projections that, we, that we've seen in the previous discussions, is that it's not only about kind of deployment, but we also have to remove kind of existing barriers and really speed up industrial development and investments. 
uh, building up this biomethane kind of industry means uh, that we not only need the technology, of course, to capture biogas, uh, if you would call it, purify it into biomethane, but we really need to build an in industry around it. Uh, and that is why, as part of this, this this Repower EU plan that we did in, in 2022, we also set up what was called the Biomethane Industrial Partnership. And this is kind of a partnership which brings together the policymakers, so those which have to put the targets in place, but also industry and other stakeholders to achieve uh, our targets. And this has been taking place since this, uh, September last year. And actually one of the, the, the results that we now have uh, coming out of this is kind of a detailed mapping of the biomethane potential for each member state in 2030. Now, why is that important? Uh, in EU legislation, similar to the kind of the indices that were discussed before, every country needs to develop a national energy and climate plan in the period up to 2030. And they have to show exactly how they expect to meet their targets in all of the end use sectors. So what we did was uh, together again with modelers, consultants, et cetera, but also in a reiterative process with the policymakers themselves, we kind of developed biomethane fishes for each and every single member state. And that will then allow again to kind of look at what is the potential? How can we really tap into that with the EU? And what is the supply chain that we need to make that to make that happen? Um, a second element, which is very interesting of this biomethane partnership and something also we would be happy to and get keen to get feedback on is that there's an, a number of new reports where we're looking at, okay, how can we not only look at the value of biomethane in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions, but also the added value locally. Uh, and then I'm not even, not only thinking in terms of jobs, but for example, also about the substrate available after you treat biogas and how could you use that again then as a, as a commodity, as a valuable product for the, for the, uh, uh, for, for example, the agricultural sector. Uh, wastewater there uh, also the recovery of materials and wastewater is also a potential kind of uh, activity that could be used to add a kind of an additional level of, of value to the, de the, the deployment of, uh, of biomethane and here we actually have some really interesting examples coming up uh, across the EU uh, uh, where actually businesses are, are taking those those cases and then a, a third example, uh, what I wanted to highlight, uh, especially because we're talking here, uh, you know, with the, the, the World Biogas Association is, is international cooperation. Uh, and one of the things that we've done this year is to set up an, uh, a work program and an, and an uh, uh, cooperation uh, with Ukraine on uh, renewable gases. Um, and here, what we want to do is to see how this infrastructure that we have and have used previously to import Russian natural gas, how can we start using that infrastructure to also tap into kind of the, the, the biomethane uh, potential that we have in our neighboring countries? Uh, how can we make this work technically, but also how can we ensure that kind of this becomes part of a single market again, so that it can be uh, delivered to those end consumers that are very keen to get it. So this is something which is a, is a it's a European biomethane partnership, but of course, uh, we encourage you uh, to get involved in this platform. It's, it's open, it's online. And, uh, and I, I really do think that this is uh, one of those, those activities that can really help scale up uh, the, the biomethane market. Now, last uh, uh, but not least, uh, what I also wanted to kind of uh, finish off with is that, of course, biogas is kind of one part of, of, of Europe's energy transition. And one of the things that we really want to do, and I'm very keen to hear also hear ideas about that, is to ensure that we are going to develop an integrated uh, 
energy infrastructure system. Um, previously, we did gas planning separately from electricity planning, electricity planning separately from heating planning. And here, what we want to do is to kind of bring uh, all of these energy carriers together and see how we can take advantage of these interactions that can ha happen. You know, so uh, one hour you might use your biogas to produce heat. The other hour you might use biogas to produce electricity. And the third hour you maybe upgrade your biogas into methane and you put it into storage. So really looking at kind of biomethane as one of those pieces of the puzzle of, of creating this integrated energy system. And this is something which I think has a lot of potential. Uh, we've only started to scratch the surface of, of, of this potential. And of course, one of my, my considerations is of course, how can we support this kind of integrated, um, um, well, this, this potential of biogas to give this integrated analysis. So with that, I'm going to close here and hand it back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Ruud. That's really interesting. I'm particularly about the integration side of uh, looking at biogas along with the other energy vectors. Because one of the issues, it seems to me, we're moving into a world where heat pumps, electrically operated heat pumps are the major heat provider. Uh, then we're going to have enormously bigger swings in electricity demand from summer to winter in most of Europe than we have traditionally been used to. So backup is going to be even more important in that world. And obviously, one of the great advantages of biogas and of biomethane is its ability to be turned on, turned off when needed and to provide that sort of backup and indeed putting into a grid its ability to compress uh, can I just kick off and abuse the chairmanship by asking you, uh, we've just seen in the slide there from Peter um, about uh, the uh, break-even price for the sort of scale of ambition that the EU Commission would have would be around, uh, I think it was um, $25, uh, and we're looking at a market price of around 11 How do you see the pace of growth of the sector being maintained uh, while bridging that gap. I mean, you've mentioned obviously the the legislation coming up uh, and looking at uh, uh, marketization opportunities, but in the end, is that going to be enough to provide the extra price impetus to get uh, rates of return necessary for development? <laughs> Maybe I, I can kind of give it a uh, my my first uh, yeah. ideas about it. Uh, and that is, of course, on the one hand side, if you do this one to one comparison, of course, today, uh, natural gas vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, via biomethane, it's clear that there is this, this cost gap. But I think there's a couple of elements uh, where uh, that are also important to consider. Uh, of course, on the one hand side, and it's very clear within the EU, we are pricing uh, the CO2. Uh, so that is one of those drivers which will help, of course, uh, cover that cover that cost, cost gap. The second one, like I said, uh, I think that biomethane in itself also creates a, low, uh, a lot of local added value. So not only the, the biomethane in itself, but uh, also some of those ancillary kind of services that you could deliver with, with biogas or biomethane, I think in itself will, will, will create a value uh, as well. And then thirdly, and that comes to the question, like why are European consumers interested in biomethane? They are willing to pay it, uh, to pay that extra price either to kind of contribute to the sustainability. So you have that price premium there. Um, but also, um, what I see more and more is that small and medium-sized enterprises and industries as end consumers are interested in, in kind of paying that little bit of a premium, because that, again, of course, is important, not only for sustainability reporting, but also to attract investments, uh, to have a product that you can put on the market and get a premium for. So I think there are a couple of leverages that will, uh, it's not just one, but a couple of those that can really make uh, biomethane attractive. But you're you're basically relying on the member states to run support schemes, which will make up the difference. Is that the is that the key thing? Because 
in the end, even with ETS at the sort of prices for carbon that we're getting out of the EU ETS, it doesn't look quite enough to bridge the gap that Peter was talking about between uh, the market price uh, currently, if you take the Dutch GTF price and, and uh, uh, the sort of cost basis that the IEA, and I have to say, we haven't shown it today, but we, we've looked at as well. Yeah. But also, I think, for example, the what I hear is that kind of the, the, the fuel obligations that we have also uh, already creates a willingness uh, of, of the off takers to pay uh, for the biogas. So it's it, it will be a combination. It's not just one uh, piece of instrument, but it will be a combination that will be needed indeed to uh, uh, to to kind of cover this cost gap. Fabio, I know you've got to uh, leave us early, but perhaps I could ask from a BP's point of view, since you are uh, the participant here who's actually got to put your money into the sector and make these things work, does that is that enough for a player like BP and, and its big super major equivalents to, to, to do the sort of rollout that you hope to do? Has Fabio frozen? Fabio, can you hear me? <clears throat> uh, I think we've lost. It looks as if we've lost Fabio for the moment. So hopefully that will come back with uh, slightly better broadband connections, which clearly we need to uh, work on. Um, uh, I don't know, Peter or, or Charlotte, whether you wanted to add anything on this question of whether the pricing is going to be adequate to sustain the sort of growth rates that we're looking at. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to come in on, on the discussion of the, the cost gap there. Um, and indeed, I mean, just, just to add to Ruth's points, in, who, who, who rightly pointed out the CO2 price is one of the kind of driving mechanisms I mean, there's also this discussion of methane. So that means the ETS carbon price. So that's just, yeah. Yeah, but you know, the the carbon price at the moment, it's 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 cap and trade. It's done it's selectively for for different users. So you know, um, to 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 bridge that incentive with the incentive to to develop a you know a biogas plant, there's various sort of support mechanisms that you might look at beyond the beyond carbon pricing. You know, you could look at uh, designing support schemes like contracts for difference, ensuring that biogas plants are are included in those, in ensuring that you know you have um, some kind of valuation of those ancillary services that they can pre provide beyond uh, what renewables like solar and wind could do. Um, and then you know, there's a lot of additional, as as we say, as we call them, co benefits that could be valued, but also. If you decide to give out low cost loans for biogas producers, you know, preferential financing is, is obviously a big thing. A lot of banks currently, even in Europe, but definitely outside of Europe, don't know how to value a biogas project. They don't know what it's competing against necessarily. They don't know how to structure a deal. Uh, you know, it's, it's far too small to be attractive to project finance or to the larger multilateral banks. Um, you know, and the smaller local banks just don't have the expertise and, and the knowledge base to to really assess uh, a project. So that's a bit of an issue that, again, could lead to lower financing costs and then lower cost of delivery of, of, of the fuel. And then finally, you know, the background conditions of all of this is to have preferential access to grids, for example, so that you can connect and you don't have to pay the surcharge. Or if you do, it's socialized across a number of different users, not just biogas users. Uh, sorry, biogas plants having to pay for the surcharge, but you might uh, think that you know all the users of the gas network would 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 end up paying for that. Um, and and in that backdrop, there there would also be gas cert certification schemes so that you'd know that you're importing or 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 consuming a certain about amount of biogas. And what that helpfully does is is kind of disconnect uh, the geography of supply and demand. You know, you could be supplying biogas in Spain and selling it in Germany. Uh, through certification, um, which which then can just lead to a massive scale up of the market and then lower costs, uh, because you're you're targeting places where where scale is possible. Um, so it's those kinds of uh, things that in aggregate can lower the cost gap um, um, over time. 
And the cost cap, obviously, on your cur curve, you only get to the higher cost levels when you're right out at the frontier of that target. So presumably, there's quite a lot to exploit at much lower levels. Uh, is there much to exploit actually at or below current price levels? So, um, I mean, we constantly re revisit um, our assessment in that respect. Um, we haven't seen a huge amount of biogas producers claiming that they're able to produce at levels below sort of 40, 50 dollars, uh, 50 euros a, 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 a megawatt hour. So, you know, a lot of the opportunity, there are some smaller, more nimble companies that claim to be able to, for example, tap into landfill gas uh, 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 structures, but that's a little more common in, in the United States than it is in Europe. Um, you know, it, it it's really a, a question of, of whether, you know, the the the, the regulatory regime is hospitable uh, to, to the scale up rather than, you know, I don't think that we can we can rely too much on 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 material cost reductions from from a technology point of view. Um, it's quite a mature technology. It's been around for a while. You know, there could be some uh, innovations in biomass gasification, but for AD, it's uh you know, uh, uh, it, it it depends on on how. I mean, if you can access feedstock very cheaply uh, at zero cost or even negative cost, that's also would be quite helpful uh, for project economics. Yeah, yeah. and and here, for example, just to to in the, these wastewater treatment projects that are coming up, uh, they are just piggybacking on top of something that needs to be done. There's a lot of environmental regulation that is uh, you need to address too, and then on top of that, you have this organic. A resource that you can can use and kind of add value to it. So it's not that you just build this project for 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 uh, for the production of biomethane, but it can really help. And and even especially if it's if it's locally, that can uh, can become very attractive. Yeah, the gas price does tend to still on the modeling dominate the revenue. However, so it is the gas price that people are going to be principally uh, looking to or associated. You know, if there's a, a another really clear source of revenue on certificates or uh the emissions trading scheme uh type of uh you know uh, uh benefits um so just looking at the um other uh i don't know if fabio uh, are you with us fabio i think we're still having connection yeah i'm, I'm back hopefully you're back uh, on change. audio uh, did you hear that discussion Can you hear me i wanted to ask you really whether how BP sees the yes, I did, I did pricing. I did. Yeah, is the price enough to bankroll your sort of development? Yeah, so let me try. Hopefully, it's also particularly interesting that BP has bought the biggest biogas yes. in the US, and obviously, gas prices in the US are a fraction of what they are in Europe. I mean, European prices are five times as high as US prices. So presumably you are able to make a go of it in the US. How come? So let, let me ask you, let me answer in two two ways there. So the one is sort of the, the macro uh, answer and one is sort of a, a more specific BP one. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. In, uh, certainly like many out of the energy transition, uh, bioenergy and bio, biogas and biometer will need some recognize the externality of, of the fossil you. alternatives. And I think in the US, the, the, the benefit of, a, of the RNG to displace vented, bio, vented uh, biogas in the US has been uh, a great support uh, to, uh, to the industry. And we talked about the, the advantage of um biomethane being increasingly uh intermittable um uh, power system right dominated by solar and wind i think the great deal of value that we can tap in in there um and then from a sort of from a from a bp perspective right it's um is you know biofuels bioenergy biogas it's you can do it good and you can do it bad it's 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 always that, and it, I think where where companies like BP and our competitors can step in and make a difference is that by by reducing um, the, the 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 cost of capital by by reducing the risk uh, through uh, through offtake agreements, uh, and also by 
stimulating the um, the supply chain and the value chains through aggregation of feedstocks, aggregation of, of demand, um, and so on. So I think uh, all of this will contribute to to close the gap. In, in most places, we'll still need some form of a support, uh, and you know with a stick or a carrot, uh, um, carrots work better than a stick. Um, you know, US is a, is a great example of how we can turbocharge certain sectors as opposed to do mandates. Um, but I, we, we, we see that, uh, you know, all this, all this will contribute to, to, to a growth. And I think the last point I want to make is that bio gas and biomethane support the local economy the local agriculture sector the local jobs uh, and also a key of uh, supporting circularity right uh, and so all of these are great ticks in the you know for 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 companies for politicians for 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 voters uh, and for for countries that are increasingly focused on uh, energy security, energy affordability, and the reducing yeah. carbon. Yeah, um, my my view, having dealt with banks and trying to bank get get projects bankrolled by banks, is that they tend to take a fairly sceptical view of warm words from politicians, and rather more want to see how realistic and um, hard the promises are on revenue um going forward so it's the it's it's ultimately the, the security of the revenue stream which 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 really uh seems to matter and obviously we're doing a lot to try and improve digestate acceptability as rude mentioned the uh, the, the the substrate or the the digestate the good potential alternative market but it is ultimately the gas market which is which is key can I just ask before you have to go off, Fabio, how you see at BP the fact that you're getting all this very big increase in LNG terminals in the US? Is that going to reduce the European gas price, at least reduce the differential? And how much buy? Have you disappeared? I can't hear you. Peter, would you like to pick that one up? <laughs> Certainly. Uh, so, yeah, of course, um, there's a long list of uh, LNG projects globally under construction. So something like 220 BCM uh, under construction today. Uh, and they're all scheduled more or less to come online after 2025. So there is this another wave of LNG. It's not the first one we've had. We, we, we had a, a most recent one a couple of years back uh, with the first US project coming online. And what we saw then was, of course, uh, you know, it had a depressing effect on uh, prices. So I think it all kind of depends on what scenario you're in and what you believe about um, demand in emerging markets, especially in Asia uh, and within Asia, especially in China. Um, if you feel that, you know, China, Chinese uh, uh, gas demand recovery will happen very strongly. We don't see massive signs of that yet. Um, and we see a lot of other um, fuels and technologies playing a role in China. So gas is, is getting squeezed and, 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 you know, we may see some revisions downward to the rate of growth in Chinese gas demand. And if that happens, then you have a very, very loose uh, LNG market. And then you have a lot of opportunistic buyers who, who, who step into the fray and you have prices that come down uh, uh, quite considerably. So in that context, it does indeed become a massive challenge uh, for fuels that have to compete on cost and on price, such as biogas. Uh, and it's not just biogas, it's, you know, it's renewables, it's other fuels, there, there could be this re real risk of a rebound effect. And that rebound effect is only, um, can only be managed um, by strong policy. So by policy that essentially, you know, continues to um, value biogas for its uh, ancillary benefits that continues to uh, set strong targets and strong signals to investors uh, for long-term growth in renewables uh, and in other uh, clean energy technologies. Um, and so we see that in Europe, by and large, um, you know, there are risks politically, of course, 
uh, especially as cost of living uh, uh, issues kind of become more politically salient and, and are increasingly linked to the green transition for, for better or for worse. Um, but certainly, you know, uh, 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 those those market forces need to be, uh, you know, uh, there has to be a policy bulwark against those market forces. Um, and and in our scenarios, you know, we see policy strong enough to look past those kinds of cycles. Uh, and indeed, the CO2 price pl plays a role in that, but as does other things like quotas and tariffs and so on. But it's not going to be an easy ride uh, by any stretch. Perhaps I could just turn to look at some, we've talked quite a bit about the price outlook and, and gas and so forth and some of the potential support and what would be necessary on that front. The other big constraint, sorry, Fabio, you're back with us. Did you hear that and did you want to add anything? Um, I won't be able to comment on the on the on the prices. I'm afraid. I, I you know I think we 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 see it. It is a story of an end, not or. Um, and so um, I, I think there's we need everything in the toolkit to 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 progress on the energy transition. And uh, there will be of course a price story, but um, we will need uh, biomethane and biomethane will grow regardless of what's going to happen on the on the uh, on the natural gas price. Particularly in places like, you know, Europe for energy security, or or other regions for support to uh, domestic um, domestic um, jobs uh, and the use of domestic resources. Just in terms of, uh, I mean, BP is notable for having a being a, a European company, but a European company that has basically invested in in this sector in the U.S. and the U.S. natural gas price obviously a lot lower than it is in Europe. How do you foresee being able to make those sort of expansion plans, given that the Henry Hub is so much lower than the Dutch TTF price in Europe? I mean, it's it's. Um, I think you need to have a. Um, so, while well, what you say is true, right? I think you need to have a have a sophisticated view of where you can tap into value, and that's where BP's capabilities come into play, right? I think. In a, in a, for example, in a power system where um, wind and solar are increasingly, um, uh, I mean, increasing share, the value of dispatchable power will be higher, right? Uh, can you still hear me? We can hear you, but you've. Okay, you've lost... good. All okay. right. Uh, I'll keep on going. And in the, in California, for example, the credit for um, renewable natural gas is uh, amongst the most generous in the world. Right, if not the most generous one. So there are places where they recognize the value of um, of, of biogas and biomethane. And BP, through our uh, trading and shipping capabilities and through our uh, global customer uh, reach, we are confident we can tap into those value and see the um, uh, see the growth in biogas and biomethane. Great. Okay, let's turn, because we, we've talked quite a lot about the pricing issue and the outlook, therefore, and how much that might depend on those, that the, the, the sort of growth rates that you've been projecting might depend on that. What about some of the other nitty gritty issues on things like food waste? And we talked a lot, Peter, about um, agri waste and indeed agri crops as a feedstock. Uh, but given that two thirds of the world's population is projected to be urban um, by 2050, uh, that food waste side is surely going to be pretty important. Uh, how do you see that developing? So, indeed, uh, Chris, I mean, this is one of the key um, points we make when we look at bioenergy as a whole, um, because, you know, currently a lot of the what we see is modern bioenergy can be produced using conventional feedstocks, you know, food, uh, uh, you know, like uh, ethanol plants and so on, all get their uh, uh, feedstocks from, from food crops. Essentially, we need to turn away from that. And um, one of the major, the fastest growing uh, sort of waste feedstock is indeed municipal solid waste. And that could arise uh, in a number of different contexts, but a lot of that municipal solid waste um, uh, growth happens in places where populations are growing, where, where countries are urbanizing. So India is a very clear example of that. Um, and so 
one of the challenges is, of course, to link um, energy and food and waste management policy together. Um, and that has historically hasn't been done even in Europe. Um, you know, and uh, we have uh, uh, composting policies and so on. Um, it's only just changing now, you know, where there's a recognition of leveraging those waste streams um, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, that has to happen in places like Indonesia, in places like India. Um, and we haven't sort of seen that policy recognition yet because often it's it's quite difficult to coordinate um, across uh, different sort of political uh, divisions. You know, you have uh, vested interests across a, a large space that you need to essentially re reconcile to get that waste stream in, in an integrated way into, into your energy sector. Uh, so the potential is certainly there. It's more about tapping into it. And I think this speaks, this this comes back to Charlotte's point about just how much potential in percentage terms we can actually meet. And that's one of the one of the uh, key sort of uh, uh, bottlenecks, I suppose, to, to, to fully tapping into it. Right. Charlotte, just on these, looking at some of these other nitty gritty issues, you know, if you will look through food waste, grid connections, planning delays, permitting standards, I know that the WBA has got a couple of potential answers on permitting and on standards. Do, do you want to just mention that, that a bit and also perhaps tell us what we might be thinking about on some releasing some of these other constraints? Well, yes, I mean, I think that the um... Um, all of these issues are actually connected as, uh, as, as it has come out through the discussion. Um, given the rate of growth we need to be seeing, the only way you will achieve it is through standardizing things uh, and speeding, uh, trying to address some of the biggest bottlenecks. Um, so quite, quite apart from um, sort of accessing some of the feedstocks and having the policies in place to do that, I think uh, certainly it's the case in Europe and, and I would imagine in, in other countries as well, actually getting a permit can take something like two to seven years. Uh, and given that the 2030 target for the Global Methane Pledge is six years away, then clearly that's something that has to be addressed. And, and we don't need to find a, 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 a really speedy solution to that. Um, but also, as, as, as I'm sure, you know, uh, Fabio would agree when you're trying to develop biogas plants in with against different regulatory frame regimes in different countries, you spend an awful lot of time trying to understand what the regulations are in every country. So if you can find a way to standardize those, uh, that that would speed things up as well. Um, but I think one of the things we we should be looking at uh, a lot more um, is linking the environmental benefits as as, as of, of waste management. Uh, to, to to the pricing uh, and regulations uh, as, as as Peter highlighted um, and the international AD certification scheme would not only uh, look to standardize the design the sort of the, the minimum standards for the design build and operation of plants but also ultimately link that to um, managing uh, methane or monitoring methane uh, and then linking that to a standardized life cycle analysis. Uh, and then linking that to biomethane certificates so that uh, we're able to clearly evidence as an industry, every plant can evidence the actual decarbonisation being achieved um, and uh, link that to money uh, so that uh, the more a plant performs better, uh, minimises methane leakage, which is obviously what we're trying to stop, uh, then the more they get rewarded for that. Um, at the moment, there's no financial reward that the industry gets for preventing methane emissions from all of these feedstocks. And, and that's pretty urgent. And, and it isn't just methane emissions either. I think it's becoming awareness of the fact that these organic wastes uh, are actually contributing to pretty significant pollution to our seas. Uh, and that that's actually probably more of an urgent issue uh, because it's causing biodiversity loss, uh, amongst other things, and, and affecting the, the rain cycle, that th that could ultimately be quite a significant price driver. Um, so um, that's something that we, sh we should be looking at in terms of regulatory support, um, which will, again, try and make potentially make quite a significant difference to the rate at which we can build plants fast but professionally as well. 
I know in the past, I think that the IEA's um, sister organization, the OECD, has been very good at looking at for the uh, for international organizations looking for the first time at how uh, different regulatory permitting regimes actually operate and how quick they are, for example, in the banking sector. Is, has the IA or indeed the Commission, Rude, got any plans to actually do some nitty gritty uh, uh, data collection on how different member states, how long they take to do planning approvals, permitting approvals, grid connections? I mean, those are the three things which tend to come up when you talk to developers um, again and again, it is the frustrations of how long it takes to go through the planning process, how long it takes to go through the permitting process, and if they are an electrical output plant, obviously it's less significant for gas grid entry, but if it, it's an electrical output plant, you know, you've still got a case where a lot of the electricity grids are really reluctant to connect renewables because they don't have the capacity so is there is there an ongoing effort to try and find out and name and shame the bad guys who are being particularly slow i mean you knew that i was going to say that but uh uh it's it would really help yes um so on your arms so uh, are we naming and shaming those uh, slow permits not necessarily are we taking action most certainly so what has happened actually and is that already last year, uh, and that was mainly because of course that we needed to have this rapid deployment of solar and wind uh, to kind of uh, reduce our dependence on, on, on natural gas. There was actually some emergency regulation coming in for connecting, for developing renewables, but also the uh, connecting renewables to the grid. So this is, was mainly due to solar and wind, biggest capacity, but it, 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 it applies to all kind of renewable power generation capacity. Now, what has, ha what has happened over the last year is that in the negotiations, and actually every member state was behind that, this has been implemented and incorporated into the new, new pieces of legislation. So there are now very clear deadlines for each member state, which I have to adhere to in terms of developing renewable projects, but also, for example, connecting them to the grid. The hydrogen and gas decarbonization package does this for the gas grid. And then on top of that, we have a new proposal, which is called the Net Zero Industry Act, which does this for clean, uh, clean energy technologies. Uh, and it has a, a specific category there, which is called sustainable biogas biomethane. Uh, which, of course, this is still being nego negotiated, but if our, our proposal will go ahead, you actually are going to have uh, very detailed deadlines for permitting for sustainable biogas for biomethane plants within the EU. Uh, and that will really kind of help and address this issue. Now, on the naming and shaming, I do think that there we're much more looking at kind of where is the potential within the EU and which member states haven't tapped into this potential yet. Uh, so we do really think that, like it was mentioned before, Germany has been kind of a big supporter. Denmark is very advanced in terms of using its biogas and integrating into the energy system. But we also have a number of energy, uh, uh, member states that haven't started up yet. And this is again, where we more work of the carrot thing. Here is a potential, let's you know, start deploying it. And then this permitting will allow that really to happen on the ground. And Peter, do you, uh, is the IEA doing anything on this? Uh, yeah, so we worked very closely uh, last year with uh, colleagues at uh, DG Reform in the in the European Commission uh, and DG Energy as well uh, to understand uh, some of the sort of key implementation measures required to meet the targets of the Repower U plan. And so chief among them was the need to reduce permitting times uh, for wind and solar projects, um, but also sort of grid, you know, those that await grid connection. Um, and and that 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 queue is very long. Um, and so since then we've we've looked uh, globally uh, in different countries around the world, so including the United States, just to see how long it takes um, 
uh, project by project to get planning and permission sorted for different types of electricity infrastructure. So for example, an overhead transmission line takes seven years, a subsea cable takes six years, a large power transformer takes three years, and that's all kind of based on a on a catalog of, of projects sort of in the queue. Uh, and that gives policymakers some idea about, about the bottlenecks, but, and, you know, we, we go into those in, in, in some reports that we've done, and notably the energy technology perspectives um, uh, report, which, which kind of does a deep dive on clean energy manufacturing supply chains uh, and, 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 and really dives into the, to the, to the bottlenecks there. Um, I think for future work, we're certainly going to continue monitoring that. I mean, that's what we do. We look at the data um, and, and, and to link them more explicitly to what happens in our scenarios. So we might see cases where if we assume that those uh, permitting times continue, how much will that delay, uh, you know, uh, our, our transition, um, you know, what's the impact on, on cost to consumers, on, on, on emissions outcomes and so on. Yeah. And, and Rid, do you see, is there, from what you can see, is there a, a very wide range of outcomes according to the member state at the moment in terms of these planning, permitting and grid connection issues? Um, yes, uh, and uh, and no. So like Peter just mentioned, indeed, uh, we really have, uh, have had uh, a pipeline of, of, of projects that, that didn't get permitted. But then now, one of the things indeed what we're doing, also with the help of IEA, is really kind of to 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 monitor that. We actually did a big report on that, which was being, has actually been published and online. But interestingly, for example, now some of the statistics coming out of Germany show a 44% increase in the number of projects being permitted for some technologies. This is not necessary for biogas specifically, but in uh, in general. So so that's that, that's a very very uh, uh, good sign. Um, what we also try to do, of course, is work on this idea of kind of having one stop shops. So especially if you're also talking about biogas or biomethane, you might have you know certain permits. Uh, that might file an agricultural file or that might file environment or maybe energy. Uh, so to avoid a situation where you have to go to three, four different kind of entities to get uh, authorization. So that's one of the other elements uh, uh, that we are promoting throughout kind of EU, EU policy. Thanks very much. Uh, we're coming to an end, but I just there's another thing which I think is a very interesting in terms of the potential outlook here is that um, the fall in demand in the EU for gas in general has been spectacular over the last uh, year or so since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think has actually exceeded even the EU Commission's target, which is not always the case. The EU Commission often has quite ambitious targets, but in this particular case, the, the demand was even, I think, 20, am I right in thinking about 20% down? 19% uh, done. Um, is that going to bounce back, do you think? Or is this uh, a pretty permanent shift? I don't know whether Peter and and, and Rude both want to uh, address that. But obviously, it's going to affect the outlook for biogas in, in Europe, as well as the outlook for fossil gas. Um, yes, so we indeed set a target. So member states on average had to reduce uh, their gas consumption with 15, 15%. And this has been kind of uh, exceeded in some member states to 20% or even more. Uh, we've also prolonged that. Um, so that means that even this year, member states are continued to be required to reduce their, their, their gas consumption. And the figures, the latest figures I've seen is that we're still minus 70% on average compared to the similar period uh, previously. Some of that is structural, which is very good. Yeah? So really, for, for example, low temperature heat in industry, uh, so you should see shifts to electrification based on renewables or, uh, uh, or biogas or, or, or geothermal or something like that. Parts of it, also in industry, of course, are also uh, because of lower production things. So there you might see some rebouncing there. At the same time, energy efficiency investments are increasing again. 
So that's also a very encouraging figure. Now, I think ultimately that doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't scale up biogas. I mean, even if you think about, you know, the the, the 35 uh, BCM target that we have for, for, for 2030, that would even with, you know, our most ambitious targets, we, we still end up with 150 or maybe even 180 BCM in 2030. So that doesn't, uh, for me, I mean that you should not uh, increase uh, biogas consumption, especially if you can start thinking about fully localized systems running on biogas, that those will be, uh, I think, uh, assets uh, irrespectively of, of, of what is happening there. Yeah. Uh, but presumably what you didn't mention is that effectively fertilizer production has ended in Europe as a result of the higher gas price or was ma massively down and you've had a lot of closure of plants. Yes. So uh, yes and no again, because yes, there was of course an immediate response to that, huh? uh, where, where fertilizers uh, production went down. At the same time, on the other side, you also see fertilizer production and certain companies going up again. Uh, also, revenues not necessarily being down as much as the fertilizer plants. So again, there you see uh, different changes. And on the other hand, you also see fertilizer manufacturers clearly making uh, making a commitment. Uh, fertilizer plants in Europe are, are relatively old compared to the rest of the world. So they are looking at kind of how can we invest today into a uh, to uh, kind of an ammonia production facility that is, that is future proof. Uh, hydrogen, of course, is there being looked at as one of those ways to do that. Your view is basically that we can move overall to a permanently lower gas demand, take the point about biogas, and then of course it means biogas actually fulfills a higher share of end gas demand, much higher share of end gas demand in a in a world of lower gas demand. But does that tally with your outlook as well, Peter? Um, so we have a scenario that models the fit for 55 targets um, where you do see an appreciable amount of, of gas demand reduction in Europe. Um, I, I think, yeah, the, the, the real question is how much of that is 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 virtuous and how much of that is is damaging economies or well-being. Uh, we did an assessment, you know, kind of breaking down all of the factors uh, that led to the so last year it was a 14 percent reduction in total EU gas demand. Um, overall in, across the whole year, about 13 or 14 BCM of that. Um, so that equates to about 60 BCM and about 13 BCM of that was industrial production curtailment, right? So that's that's times when, uh, you know, industries stopped producing whatever they were producing um, and produced at a lower level. Of course, there's, you know, industry gas demand as a whole fell 20, more than 20 BCM. So the difference there were other things like fuel switching, temporary or permanent efficiency measures, you know, uh, uh, dealing with with uh, uh, he lowering heating in factory floors or just, you know, uh, being more uh, 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 efficient on your process heating temperatures. And that we see as, uh, as, as a virtuous sort of positive change. And that's the type of thing that you see going forward. Um, you see also renewables, uh, chucked out about 11 BCM of gas use in the power sector. Now, unfortunately, that was tempered by a very poor year for hydropower, a very poor year for nuclear, so you had to call on gas units, and that raises all kinds of questions about baseload and, 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 and the need for flexibility from gas and potentially from bio biogases. But overall, um, you know, uh, uh, some of those changes also were, were also related to the weather. Um, you know, a mild winter and one that we we project forward for this year as well, um, kind of cutting into to, to household fuel use. Some households couldn't afford gas, um, you know, and lowered their uh, uh, usage that way. That's perhaps less desirable. It increases fuel poverty and so on. So there's a number of different factors to consider about the structural uh, changes to gas demand and and how much of that uh, is, is desirable or not. But in our scenario, all of it is desirable. Um, you know, there's no lo great loss in industrial competitiveness in Europe. Uh, you know, as Ruth says, uh, fertilizer production shows signs of life. Other energy intensive industries, 
the the jury is out to be honest uh it could it could go either way uh for a lot of them but uh because prices are still quite high um but we're still monitoring it uh very closely i think a lot of people saw the prices at the peak and and had the uh, consumer equivalent of a cardiac arrest so i think there was a lot of um uh you know there was a lot of reaction to fear that this would actually continue on and prices are obviously down a lot but they're still substantially higher than they were before the whole crisis um thank you very much for everybody who's participated in this um i think it's been a very interesting discussion i i just wanted to summarize by by ending up really where we began which is that everybody who is forecasting uh, biogas, um, and we've heard from the International Energy Agency and BP are forecasting very high rates of growth to 2030 and 2050. Um, we've talked about some of the potential constraints which we need to release from a policy point of view uh, to achieve those sort of growth rates. But the basic issue with biogas um, across the world is how fast can we get the sector to grow? Uh, it's not whether the sector is going to grow, it's going to grow. The question is what the trajectory is and how can we get there? And I'm sure we will go on making uh, this a good discussion um, on those constraints and on the opportunities for many, uh, many years to come. But thank you very much to all our participants, uh, to uh, Peter, to Rude, to Fabio, who's dropped off, and to Charlotte as well. Uh, for um, all the comments and I think I'm right in saying that this will be available online for anybody who wants to go back and replay the highlights um, or has missed a slide it's it, it's it's there so thank you very much to everybody uh, and goodbye and hope to see you all again before very long thank you Chris thank, thank you, Chris. you. Cheers. thank you everybody